In many ways, you're responsible for this documentary because the director, Tom Wolf, who put this film together, was inspired by a performance that you gave at the Met. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? It is, it's kind of incredible because this whole project is filled with all kinds of serendipity. Tom is uh, from Paris and a cultural man, but was not particularly involved in opera. And he was walking in New York and he saw a sign for Mario Stuarda at the Met about, f I guess, four years ago. Um, it's very uncanny to come in and see the movie posters for Mary Queen of Scots here at the same night that this is happening. Because this was, many of you here probably have felt this in the opera when you're struck by the lightning of what is this? And that happened to Tom that night, um, uh, seeing I was playing Maria in, in Maria Stuarda. And he went home and went on YouTube. And one video led to another to another, and all of a sudden he was at the mercy of Maria Callas. And it really became, uh, I think this would also be his word, sort of a, an obsession, in that he couldn't uh, get to the bottom of this. One interesting interview led to another and led to another. And I do feel that this is a project that needed to be born through him. I think one of the amazing things about the film is nobody's giving their opinion about her. These are her words. And for 60 years through her career and 40 years since her death, we've all had a say about what we think about Maria and Callas. And we like the voice or we don't, or it's Tibaldi or this or that. And this is her chance to come and be heard on her own terms. And I think that's very powerful to hear that. Well, you lend your talents to the documentary. We hear your voice reading her letters. How did you prepare for this? Because I imagine it was quite a, a daunting prospect, the idea of doing it. Uh, y y it uh, yes, and it was a really emotional experience. Um, we actually recorded the letters in Madrid, and I was in a s uh, studio, and I had the film running behind in particular when she's reading that or writing that letter to Onassis and you see Jackie come into the picture. It's really, it's heart-wrenching. We, Tom and I made a decision not to try and really imitate her speaking voice. I think that was important because it's so distinctive and, and perhaps Meryl Streep could pull it off, but uh, I doubt anybody else really could. And what was much more important was, was the honesty and, and the sincerity and the vulnerability, I think, because she's very naked in the way she writes to those people that she was close to. And so we just wanted it to be as, as clear as, as possible. It's powerful to read her words. So it was quite an emotional experience in a way, reading out those words. Oh, hugely. You know, when, when she talks about um, the aspects of, of her career and how the voice couldn't quite behave and, and this sense of, of the simplicity, the girlishness of just wanting the chance to love him and that not being enough. It's, it's a real universal sensation. She keeps talking about, I'm just a woman who wants blah, blah, blah. But the destiny was, was something else. All right, well look, let's open it up to questions. If any of you have any questions at all, just raise your hands and we've got a microphone here and we will pass it to you. So it doesn't say what she did to get uh, fired from the Met, but I'm sure you know this. If somebody today, uh, uh, an opera star, would have done the same thing, would they be also fired? Ah. <laughs> I've seen a few things where they should have been, maybe, but... Um, you know, it's very interesting. Just, I think, uh, a month or so ago, this showed at the New York Film Festival, and Peter Gelp showed up, and there was a, a whole slew of my colleagues, and it was a, a beautiful scene that I saw on social media. I couldn't be here myself. But I think I understand that Mr. Gelp officially, on behalf of the Metropolitan Opera, made an official apology, which I, <laughs> I think was pretty nice. Um, you know, I loved the segment in the film where she's talking to the reporters very openly. And very honestly, sh I think she didn't quite understand exactly what happened. Um, 
and I think it probably, there will be historians that know better than I, but I think it came down to just uh, uh, the will and the power of the clash of very strong people. So that's not terribly unusual in the, in the business. But as she says, time plays it out and time tells. And when she came back to her homecoming, I think the, the writing was very clearly on the wall about who won that battle. <laughs> So how do you identify, or if you do at all, with Maria as a singer and her offstage? Ah, I'm really glad I wasn't her. I, I look at that and I think, um, especially in the terms of history, she's the pinnacle. She's at the top and probably will always remain so because she's reached this iconic, mythic legend. And I, you know, the Sonambula aria maybe is the one that kills me the most in this because the simplicity and the mastery of what she does. So it's humbling to watch somebody at the pinnacle. But then we have the obligation to also see all the other side of it. And that's not anything I ever wanted. And the tragedy is I don't think she wanted that either. It's clear that uh, she doesn't argue with how things went in her life. She had this discipline to accept it and move on. Um, and I admire so much of that. But I watch this and I feel I'm glad I'm not that. One of the most surprising things in the film is how clear it is, and I didn't know this before seeing the film, how clear it is that, or at least what she says and what I think she wanted was to just be in love and stay at home. So I do question what is that drive that kept her going in the other direction? And, and I think that's one of the things that rem keeps her a mystery to us, and it must be one of the things that informed what she did on stage. Thank you, and it's wonderful to meet you. I actually became an opera enthusiast after hearing Maria Callas when I was in high school and started studying. I never thought of her as a conflicted woman, and kind of as a follow-up to what you said, I see a, like a fierce feminist in some ways, fighting the powers that be at the Met, but then also having reservations and wanting to be that woman in love, to be, to be the mother, to be a wife. And I'm just wondering your take on that. Do you think that's something that's very much in, as a part of her time and her growing up and her traditional background? Or do you think there's that sort of duality that exists for performers, for women in, in the opera? <laughs> <laughs> that's a loaded question <laughs> on Monday <laughs> night. Um, <laughs> by the way, it is so cool. I can tell there's a lot of singers here and there's a lot of young opera fans. I love that you guys are here. That's so great. Um, you know, it, it is, I mean, the truth, uh, to be a man in this business, you have a much easier time of having a family and doing the business. And even though that is switching, that is still a little bit present. Um, I, huh, I don't disagree with her reasoning and her understanding that you can't have both. I understand because especially the way she enveloped her career. I don't think there was a lot of room f for anything else, and I think it was either or for her, because when she did it, it, she did it with everything that she was. I look at my colleagues, and I see some extraordinary superhuman women who are finding the way to do it. And there are sacrifices, big sacrifices, involved on the edge of the career and on the edge of the family life. Um, it is not ideal um, in either sensation and or in either realm, but they make it work and they do it in a really incredible way. And for other people, it's too much and one thing has to go. I think it really comes down to the temperament, the priorities, the ambition, uh, and that can shift throughout a career as well. Um, but I think with Maria that was the integrity that she had, the demands and the pressure that she had in the career, there wasn't, I really don't think there was room for much else. Okay, um, back there with the blue arm. <laughs> 
uh, at the end of the film, we see Kalas taking on film roles, and now you have given us your voice. Is there a future for you in film? Well, I'd like to thank the Academy, but... <laughs> no, I have no idea. I did, a couple years ago, I did an independent film. I believe it's on Amazon Prime now. But the complete opposite of this on Florence Foster Jenkins. <laughs> and, and I played Florence, Florence Foster Jenkins, and it was... It w I had one of the best times in my life. I had so much fun. Um, it is on Amazon Prime, actually. I recommend it. It's good with a bottle of wine and... <laughs> and yeah, it's fun. Um, you know, I don't have that ambition at all, um, but I'm never one that, that says no. You know, this came in very organically and very um, naturally, and I was thrilled to be a part of it. Um, I love the full circle-ness of it, that, that Tom sat in the theater hearing me, and that led him to this, and, and I love that he invited me to be a part of this. Um, I'm, you know, I... If I put limits in my life five years ago or ten years ago, I would have so undershot myself. So who knows where life leads you? I have no idea. <laughs> Any more questions? I, is, I, oh. is the f is the Medea out? I've never seen it. Has anybody? S it is. Just clips on YouTube. Okay, you have YouTube. Uh, Make it uh, okay, you love you to see it. You here, right? Right here. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Joyce. <laughs> you look you, thank you. Um, <coughs> I have to like get my voice ready. Um, you said that the decision was made not to imitate her voice, but I don't know if anyone else had the same impression as I did, that I would get like halfway through listening to a letter and it would suddenly occur to me, that's Joyce, that's not Maria. And I felt very much that, you know, and I, I'm curious to know how you felt about working on it, whether it was really that you felt that you were, I mean, there was almost a kind of as if you were carrying her voice, or was it just that you were so tuned into the dramatic element that it didn't break from the narrative that she was already giving? Because there was a, an incredible continuity in sound. And so I was just really curious if you could talk a little bit about how you work through that. Thank you. Sure. It's good to see you. Cindy runs a program called Time In for kids, and she goes into hugely underserved communities and brings opera to these kids, and you cannot believe how it changes their lives. So I just love that you're here. Thank you. Time In. They'll take your checks later. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, this may sound ooey, ooey, ooey to you guys, but there, as I said, there's this element of serendipity around this whole program, and I know Tom would talk about this. There has been a driving force behind this film. It probably shouldn't have been made. It, uh, I don't know how he found the funding for it. It brought him to things like on a three-hour trip into the middle of Spain to find a monk that had some lost tapes and the monk wouldn't give it to him and then Tom said you know I do acupuncture and fit and healed the monk and then the monk said I trust you and then gave Tom the tapes I mean it that's in a nutshell but there were these really one story after another and how somehow people that never opened up before opened up to Tom and the telling of this story it's why one of the reasons we have so much footage on this and I can't explain, I was, like I said, this little sound booth, I hadn't seen the whole film, I was seeing the clips. Tom had sent me letters of hers in her own handwriting that I read. But there was, it sort of happened in, in the sound booth. And I just, I identify so much with, with what she spoke about and the depth of emotion and the fatigue and the pressure, I understand a lot of that. I haven't lived it to the extent that she has, but I, I understand it. And it was really, I'm glad we made the choice not to try and imitate her because I think it allowed me just to um, be with the words. What I try to do on the stage, to just really be there and let it, it be what it needed to be. And Tom was very good. He was directing me in the booth and it was very much um, to keep it simple and and pure I think yeah I wonder if I can just ask something H how much do you've touched on it a little bit but how much do you 
respect what the, dir the director did, keeping it just to Maria Callas' voice, and of course your voice as well, and not going to other people to get opinions from them. For me, that was so powerful because the opera world is rife with critics. And everywhere, the audience, you lovely audience, you're critics, you know? And, and we really have to earn our keep every time we're on the stage. And especially to the degree, you know, this was a perfect storm of Maria Callas at that time. The paparazzi were starting, the glamour, Kennedy, Onassis, it was this incredible time that I just can't ever imagine being repeated. The pressure, the scrutiny, everybody having an opinion about her singing, about her weight, about her personal life, about her choices, all of this. I, I can imagine how happy she must be somewhere, wherever she is, to just have the chance without, um, without that um, immediate coming back with another question, the space to tell her story. And you can see it, she does it with such uh, frankness and such honesty. And for me, I feel like it really does what the film intended. We see Callas and we see Maria and we understand that fierce, um, undetachable connection between the two. But I don't think we would have gotten that if we had talking heads saying, well, when she came back to the Met, she wasn't quite in voice and the top wasn't what it used to be. That's not what the film's about. Yeah. All right, any, any more questions? Okay, how about you right here? Thank you for being here. I wanted to know why the director didn't focus a little bit more on her young years. I may be wrong, but I think that she actually was a little bit overweight and had to fight her way to sing. And the way the movie presents itself is her mother did the whole thing, but I think she actually wanted to prove herself in younger years to be the singer. Uh, but my impression from the film, and again, I've s I'm not a historian. I might not be the right person to ask. I'm sure there are people here who know better. But my impression of especially what comes across in the film and in her words, even if she did work harder when she was younger, it's clear that her feeling was that it was because the mother was behind pushing. And she says, you know, I was singing for my mother and then my husband. And, and uh, that makes me quite sad because it felt like um, she didn't have much choice when she was young. I think she clearly knew that she had to be good and had to work hard. That idea of discipline and self-control she talks about was dr clearly drilled into her when she was young. Um, I personally love the idea that, that there's not much emphasis on the weight loss and all of that because that's, that's been out there and, and we've seen that a lot. Um, we see her in a few early photos and it's clear she made a huge physical transformation. Um, but I think the heart of it meets her when she was really r right arriving at that prime moment and how she navigated then her life from that point when her life started to become her own and not that of her mother's and, and her first husband. Well, that is all we've got time for. Thank you very much for coming out. And thank you, thank you Joyce guys. DiDonato. Thank Tom, you so much. Tom, such a pleasure. Thank you. I'm a big fan. Thanks for coming out.